to give this talk. It's an honor um, and I'm very um, excited to be presenting on this platform. So um, today we're gonna talk about a few topics. Um, we're gonna talk about T1, T2 mapping, ECV and 4D flow. Um, and we're, our focus is gonna be more clinical focus. Um, the, the talk is basically, um, is, is um, in a manner to give you more clinical perspective of um, what a radiologist needs these information for and how do they put these things together. So without any delays, I'm gonna start because we have a few different things to cover today. So- Sorry, gonna... Mama, do you wanna share your screen in presenter mode? Because we don't see the presenter mode. Oh, Just a screen it's slideshow, it's... in slideshow, I should say. Yeah, let me see. Is that gonna be in the advanced share option? No, oh no, I think if you just, I don't know, if you go down to the bottom of your slide, you have that slideshow button. Oh, I see. You're, you're, yeah, yeah. So you probably you have two screens. There. there you go. Yeah. Fantastic, thank, thank you. you. I see. I was wondering if there was something in the in the Zoom. Anyhow, um, so I'm going to refer to this paper. Um, this is a good paper for cardiovascular MRI protocol, a consensus paper from the Journal of Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance. And it talks about all different, um, I think it, the, the paper came in 2020 and it talks about all the different clinical applications of cardiac MRI. Obviously our focus here is the clinical application, not the research applications. And I think it's a good uh, review of all different protocols um, in a standardized manner. So my uh, the focus of the talk is gonna be ECV as an imaging biomarker. Obviously for ECV, you need a pre-contrast T1 and post-contrast T1. You need the hematocrit within 24 hours to calculate the ECV. And we'll go into the little bit details of what ECV is and the what this quantification actually uh, means. Uh, so I'm going to skip um, these slides about the cardiac amyloid, obviously SSFP, LGE, T1 scout for nulling pattern, T1 mapping, ECV calculations. These are all important for amyloidosis diagnosis. Um, however, ECV, um, we're trying to make a point that the ECV can actually uh, help in cases where there's like the gray zone and sometimes you see some of the findings of the of the amyloidosis and you're not too sure, but then your ECV is super, super abnormal. And, and in those cases, you can actually come down on leading with the differential diagnosis of amyloidosis among other. Um, so in amyloidosis, obviously the imaging phenotype exists. You're gonna see the thickening of the ventricles. You can sometimes see a little a little thickening of the atrial walls too, but but it's very hard to actually um, appreciate. Um, you can see here, the not just the left ventricle is thickened, but the right ventricle also thickened. Usually the right ventricle is just a pencil thin. So here you can appreciate it thicker than a pencil thin line. <clears throat> When you do LGE imaging, there's going to be subendocardial circumferential scar, but that is not seen in every case. Um, actually, most cases are patchy subendocardial preferential distribution, but the scar can be anywhere. Just like any infiltrative process, amyloidosis can have a, can can have an imaging appearance of its own in 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 different cases, and you can also see scar in the right ventricle or in in the atria. And then you have the washed out appearance of the blood pool because the amyloid deposits throughout the body are basically taking up the gadolinium from the blood pool. So gadolinium kind of retains into the extracellular spaces of, of, of all the different tissues and hence the blood gets washed out of the gadolinium very quickly. <clears throat> this is a very typical imaging appearance of amyloidosis. You can see that the, the blood where more gadolinium should be in post contrast timeline looks very dark. <clears throat> there is patchy areas of enhancement throughout the myocardium, more so on the subendocardial side. Now you can also appreciate that that there's some some areas of like intermediate gray to little enhancement patchy areas in a thickened RV wall. <clears throat> Besides that, um, it's hard to appreciate, but perhaps there might be some areas in the interatrial septum that that are enhancing. There's a little bit fluid in the 
pericardial space. So that small small amount of fluid, small pericardial effusion also goes with the uh, amyloidosis. And the, just by judging by the uh, by the null fluid here, I can tell that this this image is a PSIR, the phase sensitive inversion recovery type of LGE imaging here. And we can see some um, a little bit pericardial effusion here too. So that goes with the amyloid diagnosis. Patchy scar, you can see some endocardial preference to the scar. So these are all, when it comes to the LGE imaging, it's all um, macroscopic scar. Yeah. The, the point for ECV is to find microscopic scar. Scar, which is not um, in a macroscopic quantities yet. And that's why ECV has more sensitivity. When when the scar it develops into the myocardium in between <clears throat> myocardial um, in, in in within the interstitium in between the myofibrils, it has to be enough scar to be seen as uh, delayed gadolinium enhancement. So early cases of most conditions that give someone a scar in the heart they might be missed if you're only delaying an LGE. And LGE is a time-tested sequence. It's um, obviously it's the gold standard for SCAR evaluation at this point. However, uh, sophisticated quantitative methods in MRI, for example, measuring the extracellular volume in between the cells, <clears throat> which is obviously is an approximation. It's not 100% uh, correct match with actually pathological specimen, for example, but it, it's good enough to give you some sense of that some, something abnormal might be going on in between the myocardial, in between the myofibrils. So one of the imaging phenotypes um, in amyloidosis that could help you diagnose could be approximation of knelling pattern in early amyloidosis. So when you're scanning, um, you might have issues with knelling the myocardium. It's very common. Um, I hear um, our technical um, experts be telling us, our technologists be telling us, like, oh, in this particular case, I'm having issues with the uh, with the knelling the myocardium. And my first question would always be, like, are this are they on dialysis? Are they chronic kidney disease? Are they suspecting amyloidosis? It's very common in amyloidosis to, to, to see these kind of patterns when you're having a hard time doing a good enough nulling for the myocardium. And, and conceptually, what is happening is that the amyloid deposits throughout the body are not only holding on to gadolinium, so your blood pool is is less on get on gadolinium, if you may, than a normal person's blood pool. But at the same time, myocardium has scar in it, which is taking up uh, gadolinium. So there is some shortening of the T1 more so in the myocardium than you expect, and there's some some lengthening of the T1 in the blood pool than you expect in normal. So so the two inversion recovery curves are kind of coming towards each other between the blood pool and, and the myocardium. So here's a normal nulling pattern. And these are the timelines. Images taken at these milliseconds. And you can see, excuse me, in a post-contrast timeline. Excuse me. So all these images are taken after contrast is injected. In a post-contrast timeline, the blood has more gadolinium than the myocardium. So blood has shorter T1. So in the nulling timeline, it will null first. So as you progress the time of nulling, here is the blood complete null, about 150 milliseconds, something you would expect in normal people. And as you keep progressing, then obviously the blood pool in uh, blood pool <clears throat> Uh, past the, the longitudinal um, recovery is progressed beyond the null point. So it starts appearing as gray, right? So this is what you see at, at these timelines. At the same time, myocardium, which is holding on to less gadolinium than the blood pool, is still not null yet. You're still getting to its null point, which is about here, somewhere about like two fifty milliseconds in normal people. Now, in amyloidosis, um, and the textbook will tell you that there's a reversal of the pattern, which is uh, which is right. The the, the two the two reversal of the the two um, 
null points kind of reverse. The, the myocardium nerve nulls first and then blood pool nulls after, but that has to be a severe case of amyloidosis to get there. If you're only thinking nulling pattern, then you're missing many of the amyloidosis cases. It's not just that, it's a spectrum. As much as um, amyloid deposits, not only in the body, and but also in the myocardium, the two curves are coming towards each other. The, the deposits in the body as they progress, there is more and more, um, more and more retention of gadolinium into the tissues in the body, and the blood pool is less and less uh, holding on to gadolinium. So the, so there's a progression of T1 on that side. So the first finding we see is the con coincident nulling. The nulling of the blood pool is delayed. The nulling of the um, Myocardium is shortened because of some scar in the myocardium, the retaining gadolinium, so there's even shortening. And that is this case, coincident nulling pattern, where you see that the blood and myocardium are kind of nulling about the same time. And this would be one of the times when you're having issues nulling the myocardium. The other pattern is like reverse. It's like you're trying to null the myocardium, and myocardium nulls first. And then the blood pool nulls because there's just too much scar in the myocardium that it's holding on to get alenium and T1 is short. And conceptually, to understand that it, um, here is the, uh, here's the signal intensity um, on the y-axis. Um, your uh, x-axis is the time in milliseconds. And you gave an inversion recovery pulse. You gave your 180 pulse. Here, all the magnetization is tipped down. Every single hydrogen ion is um, is tipped in the opposite direction and, and then the longitudinal recovery starts and the longitudinal recovery is starting at the at the rate of the t1 properties of the tissue depending on how much gadolinium is uh, that tissue is retaining so so blood pool obviously recovers pretty fast in a normal person because uh, there's more gadolinium t1 is short you're going to cross the null point sooner in terms of milliseconds. Myocardium, normal myocardium. T1 is, uh, the magnetization is gonna recover rather slowly than the than the blood pool. So there is the difference between the two null points. This point right here, this point right here. But as these two curves move closer towards each other in the cases of amyloidosis, um, not only because of the changes in the gadolinium in the blood pool, but also the changes in, in, in the gadolinium, overall gadolinium from the scar in the myocardium, these two curves move towards each other and they can overlap in this case where you see the co coincident or if it's a even severe case, more deposition of it can reverse. And that is this case. And, and I use amyl amyloids because um, it's a very good example to understand the, the scar, how deposition happens in infiltrative cases, and how um, how ECV adds value um, to all these um, clinical pathologies where you are suspecting microscopic scar. Um, and, and there is evidence that if you treat um, these patients early on, you can at least arrest the process, if not reverse it, um, in, in some pathologies, depending upon what pathology you're talking about. <clears throat> so bottom line is that they, the, the ECV is highly elevated in amyloidosis cases. Now, extracellular volume is essentially the amount of extracellular matrix, the extracellular fluid, all that stuff in between the cardiomyocytes. Extracellular volumes might be high in most tissues in like 60s and 70s. However, the cardiac tissue is very well tightly woven networks like a syncytium. There's not much space in between the cells. We expect quantitatively, you expect that space to be about like less than 28, 30 percent. And in, in the cases of amyloidosis, since there is expansion of the extracellular volume, um, the ECV values uh, are, are higher. And that, that ex Expansion is from uh, the deposition of the protein and the changes thereof that happen into the extracellular matrix in between the cardiomyocytes. Um, just an just a color coded map of ECV. Um, it shows that sixty one percent ECV at the in 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 the um, 
basal to mid septum of the myocardium, which is an abnormal value. And, uh, you have to normalize your T1, T2 values and ECVs for institution to institution base, but roughly normal ECVs be about like less than 28 to 32% in, in most institutions, depending on um, where you are. So th this is clearly a case of uh, amyloidosis with, with lots and lots of depositions. So I'm gonna skip this slide. I'm gonna skip this too. This is beyond the scope of our um, discussion here. Um, it's just, there are different imaging phenotypes and sometimes you can predict the type of amyloidosis just based on imaging. Although it's, it's, um, it's rather, very hard to do that. Uh, getting to the diagnosis of amyloidosis could be challenging sometimes, uh, even there. Um, so ECV as an imaging biomarker not only helps you with the diagnosis, but it's also there are more recent literature coming out that proves that ECV actually predicts the outcomes. It can help understand the treatment response if the treatment is working or if, if the treatment is not working or if the disease is progressing. And again, amyloidosis is a good example. Uh, so there are a few therapies for amyloidosis, for example, gene silencing and all that. And there's been studies done to actually follow up the extracellular matrix, extracellular volume in, on those patients and see if the treatment is working for someone and if there is a correlation with the gold standard, which let's say could be a nuclear medicine study in one particular type of amyloidosis, right? And the two correlated. And the bottom line is that um, as the treatment works, the ECV levels progress, uh, de uh, decrease, declined. And in the patients who were non-responsive, where um, progression was happening and the disease was progressing, their ECV values were going up. So, so it's not that ECV is becoming as a diagnostic tool in the cardiac MRI, um, in, in let's say diagnosis of infiltrative conditions like amyloidosis, um, per, perhaps also helping with the diagnosis of inflammations like inflammatory cardiomyopathy, inflammatory myocarditis or other kind of myocarditis and others. It's becoming a tool to also predict the outcomes for the patient, to predict the prognosis. And, and you may your ECV now and you may your ECV after treatment and you can, you can probably have a sense that um, that the treatment is working or not. There's more literature coming in in applying the, um, the ECV below diaphragm, but we're not going to uh, get into the, those details. Um, we're going to touch a little bit on the parametric mapping. I'm not going to go into the imaging physics uh, or much detail into how to acquire these sequences. I'm just going to touch on, from the clinical perspective, what it means for a radiologist when we are ass assessing, analyzing, and putting it together for the, for the patient, what it means for us, uh, the T1 and T2 mapping, the T2 uh, star mapping. So. T2 mapping is a tool, is a quantitative tool for us to assess edema. Uh, it's a tool that a clinician or radiologist or cardiologist is basically relying on to see if there is um, edema fluid within or outside the um, outside the cardiomyocytes. So it's a uh, yeah. pixel by pixel analysis where you can either um, color code the image, or you can draw an ROI and get a um, get a, a T2 value in the milliseconds. And we have our institutional uh, adjusted normals for that, and higher than that would be your abnormals, and you will know that this, there is edema, which could be seen in the setting of, let's say, acute, um, my, uh, acute um, MI. It could be seen in the setting of uh, myocarditis in the active phase. <clears throat> Any condition that will give edema in the heart, your T2 values be elevated. Uh, and one caveat be um, post-transplant uh, hearts. In post-transplant hearts, you will you will have your uh, T2 cutoff or threshold about five to 10 milliseconds higher than the normal. Um, it, is, um, it is known from research that the T2 quantitative future values in a transplanted heart could be a little higher than the normal, and that is clinically not significant. So we would <clears throat> use a little higher cutoff for the, 
for the most transplanted hearts, about five milliseconds more than our regular cutoffs. This is just a summary of different sequences you can use. <clears throat> um, obviously, some of these are hi historical. Um, uh, the field has progressed a lot since. Um, here is um, <clears throat> uh, the visual this, the depiction of T2 maps, um, obviously color coded here with the kind of heat map. Uh, and you can see that there is edema in the anterior septum, interior wall, lateral wall, and this is about basal to uh, basal to mid uh, myocardium. Now these walls kind of look uh, look normalish. So you can see appreciate that the lateral wall here on the four chamber looks there is looks like there is some edema here. The septum looks okay. And when you look at the uh, LGE images, you can see that the not so much in the septum, but on the lateral wall you see some sub-epicardial um, scar. You see some kind of, also some like rat bite kind of patchy sub-epicardial um, sub scars. And, and, and these put together will give you a diagnosis of acute myocarditis uh, based on the um, modified uh, Lake Louise criteria. Now, this is a case, we talked about the heart transplant normal Five, about five milliseconds, more so than the normal. But if there is a rejection, then obviously it's going to be more than that. And that's the dilemma. <clears throat> Many normal transplant hearts will have a little elevated T2, just normal. It, it's, it, it's, it's not that they are having transplant rejection, but if they have transplant rejection, the inflammatory response be robust enough that you're going to see patchy areas of elevated T2. So you can see that the teaches a little bit here and here, different areas, and you will see scar in those areas. And that scar could be, um, <clears throat> could be, uh, it's going to be obviously in a non vascular distribution, but could be anything, could be sub-epicardial, could be mean myocardial. Talco subocardiomyopathy, another, uh, another important diagnosis where actually T2 mapping helps a lot. Um, before T2 mapping, all you rely would be segmental, hypokinesis or akinesis. One of the segment or a few of the segments are not moving um, appropriately. And <clears throat> sometimes you describe the ballooning of the apex and all those different descriptive morphological features, but not all patients have that. And sometimes someone will have low normal ejection fraction or low, low ejection fraction, and you just cannot put it all together. And suddenly when you look at the T2 map, you'll be like, whoa, the base and mid segments look okay, but the apex is um, elevated into you too. There's edema in the apex. What if it's a case of Takasubo? It's been described in Takasubo. And, and, and that is what's happening here. If you uh, if you look closely, there's edema in the in the apex, but the other segments are spared. There is no scar, obviously. Most Takasubo majority, overwhelming majority of Takasubo patients are not going to have a scar. It's very uncommon and rare to have a uh, a um, scar on the LGE imaging on Takosubo cardiomyopathy. Perhaps it could be from a leftover from a previous uh, previous pathology. Um, I have not seen one yet, actually. Um, and and so you don't have scar. There's low normal EF. There 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 may or may not be morphological features, and you're just you're not sure why the person has um, low normal or low EF, and then you. When you do your T2 mapping, you see you clearly see edema in those segments, and you're like, this all puts together. These are the exact same segments that are hypokinetic or akinetic. And you can raise the possibility of stress induced cardiomyopathy, Takosubo, aka. Um, so T2 mapping gives you a quantitative method of analyzing edema into the myocardium. It's a very powerful, very useful tool clinically. Um, before T2 mapping was commonly used, uh, and, and still in practice, we used to use dark blood sequences to look for edema. Now it's very visual, it's a very qualitative method. You are just looking through images and you're assessing and judging um, if there is um, edema. And a subtle edema could be, could be missed even by ex experienced radiologists on those sequences. So someone did a study and, and they came up with the numbers um, and, and T2 mapping is much more sensitive. The accuracy is 85% to tell edema versus 56% on dark blood T2, which is just a little more than 50%, like a 
flip of coin. Um, so T2 does add clinical value um, in your assessment on cardiac MRI, um, whether it's Takosubu or acute, car acute MI or acute myocarditis, inflammatory myocarditis, inflammatory cardiomyopathies, or acute rejection um, for the heart transplant, all these conditions. Um, here's the paper reference um, where the numbers come from and they compare the two. There's a QR code um, that you can actually um, scan to get the paper. Now T2 star mapping, um, another useful tool, although very few uh, applications, mainly used for iron deposition. And it's obviously um, based on your um, T2 star uh, curve, um, which is obviously a sharp falling curve based on your free induction decay. Um, essentially, um, you are trying to see the, the local, um, local magnetic field in homogeneities. And anything that would cause that would give you a, a shorter T2 star values. So it's not just the iron deposition, but we assume that whenever we're looking for iron deposition and we see T2 star values lower than expected, we suspect that there is iron deposition. But we, the, the, the clinically um, most important take home point is that T2 star sequences um, and imaging is a, it has to be very methodical. Um, there's just every reason for these uh, sequences and these results to be faulty. A little bit breathing motion, a little bit patient motion, anything that misregisters, misaligns the images, anything that even the slightest changes perturbs the magnetic field is going to give you faulty results. And all these things, what are they? What, what they're going to do is to decrease T2 star, uh, star values, falsely. Um, anything like motion artifacts any slightest disturbance of the magnetic field, imperfect shim of the magnet, all these things. So, so to, to rely on your T2 star mapping, your magnet has to has, have a good shim. You, you, the patient has to be the best patient of the day, be good breath holds and all that. And only then, that's why when we look at these, when we're trying to analyze and put ROI and do pixel by pixel analysis and put the and putting ROI is to see what the T2 star mapping values are, let's say in the mid septum. Before we do that, we have to do a quality check. We have to look through every single sequence and see if there are motion even between acquisitions and all that stuff. And usually the numbers are used um, in clinical practice at about 20 milliseconds, less than 20 milliseconds. Um, you suspect that there is some sort of uh, iron deposition. And then the more, the shorter the T2 star mapping values are, the higher the deposition suspected. <clears throat> here's the, um, here's the uh, T2 star mapping. Uh, here's the uh, conceptual um, diagrams from the NMR experiments. Uh, here's the equation, essentially your, the, the difference between your T2 and T2 star is the um, is all the factors of, uh, around like the local magnetic field disturbances and all that. It's your free induction decay. Uh, you tip the magnetization, how it recovers versus uh, <clears throat> versus in T2, um, you actually have adjusted your accounting for um, the local um, magnetic inhomogeneities and all that stuff. So T1 mapping, um, we basically touched T1 mapping briefly on the ECV. Um, T1 mapping, um, essentially you're trying to create a pixel map uh, of the native and post-contrast T1 values of all the tissues in the image. So our focused, Im uh, focused tissues are gonna be blood pool and myocardium. And that's, what, that's the two numbers before contrast and after contrast that we knew to calculate the ECV. So, Obviously, Molly and Schmolly sequences are used. Um, the, actually, there's lots and lots more coming in, and, and there's tons of like new uh, improvement in these sequences. Um, but clinically, what it means that native T1 is is a instance to layer. Back in the days, it was used uh, to predict uh, this could be amyloidosis, this could be X Y Z, but uh, now, mostly um, T, uh, T1, native T1 is actually interpreted in, in, in 
I've been comparing them to the T1 post contrast to calculate the ECB. And um, that there's not much utility of just doing T1 mapping by itself um, for the most part. Um, the, here's some uh, abnormal T1 and T2 values in the different clinical scenarios, things that will give you elevated T2 as we talked about edema, things that will give you abnormal uh, low T2 are going to be fat deposition, uh, so it's going to be iron deposition. Fat deposition can give the, give the same. Now, uh, iron overload will both decrease the, uh, the T1, T2, and T2 star values. Um, so essentially the way I think is that iron is going to disturb the magnetic field and all the signal intensities is lower, but that conceptually that's not true. That's just a memory aid for myself. Um, what it does is iron overload kind of, when your transverse magnetization is dispersing, the iron overload actually perturbs that and dephasing happens faster. That's your uh, FID, the free induction DK, and it happens faster. That's why your T2 values are shortened. And your, since your uh, T2 star values are shortened, and since your T2 values rely on your T2 star values, so, so hence T2, um, T2 values are shortened too. Um, I'm trying to think if we, so we talked about the T1, yes. Um, ECB we have talked about here is the equation. Essentially, you need native T1 of the myocardium, native T1 of the blood pool. You need the post contrast values of T, uh, post contrast T1 values of the myocardium, and you need post contrast T1 values of the blood. And besides that, you need the hematocrit of the patient within 24 hours. And these are the things that you need to uh, calculate ECB. Now, your T1 values have to be. Um, have to be normalized for the uh, pre and post T1 values have to be normalized for the institutional standards. And then only then you can use the ECB. And this is true for all parametric mapping, for T1 and T2 mapping. Um, there, there is um, something called synthetic hematocrit uh, option where you can actually predict ECB without having a hematocrit within 24 hours, just based on the differences between before and after contrast in those images, um, the algorithm kind of adjusts for that, um, um, but they are not very well validated and they're close enough for the for the TCB that you get for the uh, using hematocrit. But um, it's advisable to use the um, given the current literature, it's probably more preferable to use the um, TCB actually using hematocrit within twenty four hours. So we talked about all the different, um, basically the T1, native T1 values and ECB, they actually um, become abnormal on a spectrum, let's say in infiltrative conditions as more and more uh, scar deposits. So, so there are some studies on the, um, on the imaging pathology kind of correlation for these. Uh, this is a good paper for T1 mapping and ECV um, and, and, and the use in the clinical practice. Um, uh, it's actually a really good uh, review of the, of the topic. Uh, this is a good graphic to actually conceptually remember which, which imaging pathologies are going to have what kind of native T1 and ECV. So it's a, it's a really nice, it, it, it actually visually gives you um, which medical conditions are going to have, cardiac conditions are going to have, what kind of T1 and ECB values. We're going to touch very briefly, since we're running um, out of time, we're going to touch very briefly on the 4D flow. And I'm only going to talk about one main application of the 4D flow that is being explored at the institution I trained at. Essentially, 4D flow um, is different than than the uh, 2D phase contrast imaging from the fact that it's time resolved. So you have the whole cardiac cycle, obviously, just like that, but you also are getting volumetric isotropic data. So you're acquiring the whole block of volume um, voxels by voxels. And it not only, you can not only reconstruct it for the phase contrasts, just like the, your 2D in plane phase contrast images, but you can also reconstruct the um, 
the uh, magnitude images out of that, and and that you can use as as anatomical sequences, just like your face contrast come up. <clears throat> uh, have the magnitude images to look at the anatomy and see what's going on, and then you have your face contrast images where you actually see the flow. So here's a on the left, you see a regular um regular um. 4D flow acquisition of the chest, you see that the, the flow in all these different chambers could easily be um, could easily be seen. And you can set different planes, you can set um, off-axis planes, all the data for all the quantitative assessments for flow dynamics in the chest for that one cardiac cycle exists there. It's not it's not that you only set the plane on aortic valve and you're only going to get aortic valve quantification. You can troubleshoot. And, and this is really important in complex um, cases. For example, let's say there is a dissection and we're looking for a fenestration where, where the blood flows into the dissection, how much blood is flowing into that. So advanced, obviously, advanced problem solving. Um, congenital heart diseases, this could be a, an invaluable tool where you actually, there's just not one valvular lesion, there are multiple valvular lesions, and then you can just like evaluate them all. Um, you can also um, have the algorithm do the path lines uh, drawing, drawings for you, and you can actually visually appreciate how the flow goes through these regions, and that can give you some very um, valuable insights. For example, in this case, you can see that there is an original dilatation in the descending aorta, and the flow, so th there's some, some dilatation here too, so some swirling here, there's regurgitation, you see that the flow falls back into the ventricle, but besides that, you see that there's lots and lots of swirling in this, in this dil dilatation, and that, um, effect that is changing your laminar flow is kind of swirling going back and forth and that and the and and, and also that the um, the path lines kind of hit this wall so there's some shear stress here too so all these uh, valuable insights that you are not going to get on um, any other imaging sequence um, so it's a it's becoming a very valuable tool um, in in cardiac MRI practice um, so we talked about the um, talked about how it requires volumetric isotropic time results in these sequences, and you essentially have three dimensional velocity encoding. Your you you can essentially set up any plane and and get the uh, quantification based of that. So here a plane cuts through the aortic valve. You can see that there is a bicuspid aortic valve, two leaflets. Here is the flow coming at us. So essentially, you can create similar images as a phase contrast based on your plane. And essentially, you can set up planes every different uh, places in all acquired uh, data. Uh, so bicuspid aortic valve has been uh, really, um, uh, is one of the areas that has been studied a lot um, with the, uh, with the um, 4D flow. And there's lots and lots of insights, not only uh, about how it alters the flow dynamics at the level of the valve leaflets, but also how it alters the flow dynamics subsequently into the ascending aorta and, and the wall shear stress from the eccentric jets, because obviously it's not three leaflets, it's two leaflets, and, and the jet is not going to be centric into the ascending aorta. It's going to hit one of the walls, and that wall is going to get weak. So tons of correlations are made between the registrations done between the wall shear stress and the flow dynamics. And this is the whole new area of investigation where there's radiological and pathological correlations being made between, this is what you see on the fluid dynamics. This is the wall you suspect is getting the most wall shear. And on um, obviously pathological specimens in those areas which had elevated, suspected elevated wall shear stress, you have less elastin, thin fibers, increased distance between the elastin and other fibers and, and the wall is thinned out. So it's an exciting time to um, to be putting it all together, not just the flow pattern, but how it affects the, the dynamics of the wall, how aneurysms develop and, and all that. So tons of uh, studies being done on that. Uh, 
one of my personal favorite applications of 40 flow MRI in in in, in chest is is the um, applications towards the aortic dissection, and you can see that compared to a CT angiogram or even an MR angiogram, uh, this is just a a beautiful depiction of how the dissection flap is existing here. You see exactly where the where the end treat here is, where the fenestration is, where the flow comes into and keeping this patent. And that adds valuable insights for endovascular repair. Someone who's gonna come cover this portion and put an endograft here, they know where exactly to cover. And and in, in, in a theoretical sense, you can set up a plane here and you can even do the maths, you can actually put a plane here, you can put a plane here, and you can see what fraction of the flow is going into, into the false lumen and keeping it patent. And, and, and if the false lumen is increasing in size, or you can predict if it's gonna increase in size, if they're gonna need a surgical repair, all that stuff. So it's it's um it's beyond it's much more information that you're gonna get from the CT angiogram or from an MR angiogram. And um, so aortic dissection is is in the thorax or in, in the abdomen is, is one of the areas of investigation which is being studied and it seems like it has a promise uh, to to uh, to improve the patient care and outcomes and management. Um, now they came up uh, back in Northwestern they came up what's called something with what's called 5D flow MRI. I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, essentially, it's a self-gated uh, free-running framework. So essentially, it's going to get itself, it's going to do the respiration navigation kind of itself. You can just sit in the scanner, free breathe. And that, I'm assuming that these sequences are uh, longer. I'm not an expert on, <laughs> on this by any means. It's just early work. I'm just quoting it here. But it's exciting time to be in the in the field of studying um, um, 40 and 5D flows. And with that, um, I think um, that is all. Um, and thank you for your attention. And I really appreciate um, um, the, the opportunity. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. That's a lot um, there, but uh, this is a great start. Um, we're now open for questions. So let me just say, I think there may be a question, uh, amazing presentation. Yeah, so if you have any questions, there's two ways we could go about this. You can drop a question in the Q&A. Yes, the session is being recorded, um, Alex. Um, you can drop a session a question in the Q&A, or you can raise your hand and uh, ask your question directly. I see there's a question about the recording. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be, it has been recorded. Okay. Okay, so Francis, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Omar, for your presentation. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, just wondering how you get your measurement for the T1 and the T2 mapping. Mm -hmm. Do you have to place a ROI on the myocardial? And uh, so if that is the case, do you go for the whole myocardium or a suspected place that you place the ROI? So, we the the way we perform analysis we use uh this um soft recall circle it's a third party solution obviously um different than um what the scanner is made from what the software of the scanner is you import those Im we imported those images into this software now there are multiple software you can use the one of your choosing or you can come up i mean a, a computer scientist can come up with a with a software of analysis. It's it's just ROI based measurements, right? All that information is actually sent in inline reconstructions from the scanner. So essentially, even on your packs, you can draw ROIs and get those measurements. But if you want to be a little more sophisticated, you can bring them into the dedicated software, the one we use, and what it does is it automatically detects the subendocardial margin. It automatically detects the epicardial margin, and it it basically gives you segmental map. So if it's if it's drawn its contours really nicely, then you have a really good understanding of which segment has um, what T two. You can also tweak those um, on 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 the software. 
So that's the most common method. Now, I've seen uh, some, it, it's also very observer dependent, Francis. Uh, I've seen some people who just do the analysis where they're suspecting something. They will, on their backs, they will just draw something and they'll be like, okay, I don't see any edema there. We'll, we're good here. And some people who are a little more um, comprehensive, even if they are not suspecting something, they're always going to do go do the analysis. So it also depends upon the observer. But I think um, for uh, comprehensiveness sake, what you can do is you can actually do a um, do the comprehensive analysis of segmental maps of the T1 and T2 and ECV. And that's the peace of mind. You're like, I did not miss any myocardial segment that could have an analogy. And especially the cases where you might, there might be segmental uh, abnormalities. For example, in rejection cases, um, if you don't see grossly not seeing much, you're not going to find just something in one segment. But let's say Takusubo, if you didn't pay good, much attention, uh, it's easy to skip the, miss the edema in the in the apices. Sometimes apices are tough areas too. Sometimes you have like, you know, it's curved and all that. So you have volume averaging and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, doing like a comprehensive segment based map is, is, is the key, I think. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll just uh, see that any other questions while people are thinking of the question. Um, or maybe this is another one here. Um, some of us are at work. If you have any questions, that we're going to... okay. Oh, yeah, some of them are working, as you know, <laughs> while attending this video. So if there's any questions they have, they could always send it to us. We'll put that together in an email and send it to you, and we'll always share it back to them. So that's fantastic. So if you Go to the recording again and you find any questions, send it to us and we'll compile it and send it to uh, Dr. Umar and we'll get back to you on that. Um, I find 4D flow very fascinating uh, a, as a neuro person because, you know, we're trying to even start to look at cerebrovascular um, imaging with 4D flow. Um, I always have a question. This is more of a practical question as to the analysis. Are there straightforward analysis software now that you guys as clinicians use to analyze body flow? Is this still in the research realm? Um, so um, it is very institutional dependent. Um, some institutions are using 40 flow routine. Some pediatric practices are using uh, 40 flow a lot for congenital heart conditions. So there's Obviously, you know, any new technology, there is this phenomenon where there's early adopters, there are late adopters, and there are uh, people who are skeptic, all that stuff. So it's, we're in that phase where there is some adoption and there is other places it's only in research. So the, the place I trained at, we were using it routinely clinically. Um, most places I know it's only research too. So... Um, I would just leave it at there. Uh, the point of talk is that this is something coming out and it has lots of potentials. And um, I think um, that um, it actually does improve patient care um, if you apply it only mm -hmm. to the patient populations which are going to help from this. Like yeah. myocardial, myocardial test case is not going to be helped from but our congenital. It might change the outcome and management of someone with a congenital heart disease. So I think it's a powerful tool that is taking its time to come into a clinical practice at this point. And, yeah. and there's going to be tons of applications in neuro. The only problem and challenge there is that the vasculature is small. Yes. And getting the resolution, it's just too much time. Yeah. Well, we're doing 3D mm -hmm. flow in the brain now. So I think it's just a matter of uh, people just getting up to speed with 4D flow in the brain. But yeah. um. The one, the one question I asked about the software is, in your practice, what software do you guys use for, for doing some of this analysis for the flow? Because it's becoming, it's becoming a standard sequence now that is kind of available with the scanners. Um, it's just a matter of how do you do some of this analysis? We have a, um, a circle, CVI, come in uh, Friday and again in October to give a hands-on on analysis. And they also have a package for 4D flow. So I was wondering if that's something that you, in your own experience, use. So in my training, what we used was um, Circle. We have Circle here at Hopkins too. And if we have kids, we don't do it routinely. Um, we do it for research purposes. 
um, here. So yeah. uh, the, if we have to use that, um, let's say an outside study has a 40 flow component to it, we will use a uh, circle. So I have found circle very um, kind of, um, easy to learn too, but there are other really good uh, competitors out there too. And they actually have decent software. Some of the, some of the software out there might be more sophisticated than what Circle might offer. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm not an expert on like, obviously, and I'm not like walking for one or the other. Yeah. I can tell you there are good tools out there that the tool that um, your program has, um, should probably give you the quantitative analysis. Now, I know that the um, at, at Northwestern, since um, uh, Dr. Merkel is is um, one of the pioneers of the yeah. field, um, he, uh, for the most part, from like around like 2010 or whenever the whole thing started, he's been using his own um, software homegrown software. So there's, uh, yeah. if someone has the ability and has the research expertise enough um it's not a hard solution to like come up with a uh, <laughs> homegrown yeah solution. no we uh yeah when i was a postdoc yeah when i was a postdoc we tried we had marco's uh mark's uh, sequence where i was as a postdoc i was trying to get it implemented for brain imaging and so um i, I had those scripts my lab scripts uh it took a little bit of tweaking here and there but um yeah so it's come a long way since 2010 when we also first started dabbling uh, into it, trying to get it to work for yeah. for brain imaging. And yeah, so it's it's good to see that there is a lot of, and I'm happy to see a lot of the clinical applications that you sort of highlighted for it. Um, so this is fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any other uh, questions? We still have maybe a couple minutes um, before we thank Dr. Umar. We still got two or three minutes. So. Um, any questions? Let's see with any hand raised. Um, no. Okay, so um, no, this is fantastic. We thank you so much, uh, Dr. Umar, for this fantastic presentation. And if there's oh wait, there is one question. Okay. Um, this is from uh, Tudoyen Kibet. It, is it possible to obtain the peak flow velocities? And if yes, does it correlate with echo measurements? So the What's peak flow one? velocities, um, good question. First, it's, you know, it um, visually sometimes what you can do is, so your analysis, the way the software does the analysis, you put an ROI and it gives you an average of that. Now, obviously, if you think laminar flow and let's say this is this is the circle the flow is going through, the center of the flow is going to be faster and the periphery is going to be slower and slower in, in layers, just the regular laminar flow. When you put an ROI around that vessel, it's gonna average everything in that in that area. One thing you can do is you can put a smaller circle in the center of the vessel, and you will have some sense of the fastest flow in that vessel at that point. Now, there are tons of studies that actually have good correlation with the uh, echo measurements of the 40 flow in the chest. Now, again, these are, we're talking large vessels. We're talking about big vessels. Um, the problem is that when it comes to smaller vessels, there's lots and lots of inconsistencies. Now, besides that, um, any method used um, in complex, think of complex congenital heart disease and you're trying to evaluate multiple valve lesions and sometimes your numbers just don't add up whether you try 2D phase contrast MRI, mm -hmm. whether you try echo, whether you try 4D flow. So there is that too. Sometimes you're just not gonna be able to find that shunt or that we're missing some vessel somewhere, which is, you know, which is moving flow in or out somewhere. Or mm -hmm. we're a little um, small um, defect somewhere. Those cases are always going to be there, but there is a um, good uh, correlation with the 2D phase contrast and the echocardiography in big vessels. It's a different challenge when it comes to smaller vessels, just like in neural vessels and lymphatic vessels, all that stuff. Um, it's just the resolution is too small and you need lots and lots of time to actually give reliable numbers. 
So the, I guess they don't correlate so well with echo, echo measurements for that particular reason, because of the variation in potential flow velocity by averaging. So when you talk, when it's, it's so it, I'm just trying to sort of visualize again, just going by what we do in, in neuroimaging, if it's peak velocity, um, we're looking at the max, almost like the max velocity, right? Okay. Do you get the same type of parameters with uh, for the flow when you do it? So it's always so, averages over that. So it doesn't give you the peak velocity. You can, uh, since it's all included, um, that information exists there. It's just like current day clinical softwares sometimes we may not have the option. It's just going to average the ROI. Now, that information of all the flow is included. So you can actually draw a smaller area on a smaller area of flow. Let's say aorta is three centimeter big vessel. And in the center of semi aorta is the fastest flow. You can just circle that and it will give you higher measurement than circling the whole thing. But yeah. if you have a homegrown software, um, you can actually encode the path lines yeah. to be like, okay, the flow more than one meters per second, yeah. label it green, the flow from more than 1.5, label it red, all that. And you can just visually see your path lines that this flow looks much about this range. So you can color code that. Now, all the information pixel by pixel exists. It's just like how sophisticated your analysis method is. Again, remember, this comp the, the principle is exactly the same as the two mm -hmm. phase components. So you're yes. giving two opposite gradients. Now, you are basically having the proton spin faster and then spin slower. Mm -hmm. And whatever the differential is, that's yeah. the phase they gain from the flow, that yeah. phase is added on and you measure the phase. Yeah. So any single proton in every single voxel encodes the exact yeah. measurement. If you put yeah. ROI on a pixel, it will give you the value. So you have to know where the peak flow is. That's the that's the difference of analysis here versus the analysis when you perform for the echo. Yes. Okay. Just I see. You have to have software, you have to have, you know, you have to know your quantitative tool, how to decode that information. So you, it's not hard to find the peak velocities. It's just most clinical softwares don't think that way. They will just give you that flow in this plane is averaged out to be this. Mm. So, that's yeah, fair. That's, that's fair. Yeah. No, that's that's a very good question. Okay. All right, so I think we're we're it for time. Dr. Umar, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sure that uh, the trainees we have here very much appreciate this talk. Again, we might be expecting some questions for us from us, and we curate whatever questions that we have and send it to you so we can get everybody to be able to um, also benefit from the questions that are coming in. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to the platform. I, uh, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you.